Welcome to the second episode of 12 Bar News. I am joined this week by The Badger. Yo! And Bullwinkle. Yo! Glad you guys are here. We're uh, missing our fourth member, Darsh. He's sick this week, so uh, we're just going to carry on with the three of us. Uh, we're going to jump right into a segment we here like to call... What's happening?! <laughs> And our uh, first point in our What's Happening segment is that Beto O'Rourke is running for president. You might be asking yourself, why would you be talking about a presidential candidate on a non-political music podcast? And that is because O'Rourke is a musician who's been in bands uh, out of uh, Texas for years. He uh, is a bass player, so is a special note to me. Um just because you know the bass is the best and most important instrument in the band, but in uh, in <laughs> in the uh, early '90s, he was actually in a band with uh, Cedric Bixler Zavala uh, called Foss, and uh, you might know Cedric from At the Drive-In or the Mars Volta, two gigantic bands in the uh, indie progressive scene. And uh, yeah, Beto was in a band with them. Uh, be uh, this was in '91, I believe, at Columbia University. And uh, the band was called Foss. And I think it's really cool that uh, the punk rock kids are finally starting to grow up and maybe actually be able to influence something political. This being said, not really my cup of tea. He's uh, too much of a moderate for me. I don't know what you guys think about Beto. But, music! Uh, but music. I was going to say, did you listen to Foss? Are they any good? They're okay. They're a punk rock yeah. band. I was expecting less so it's a good thing that they were you know they they definitely were above my expectations do you uh first do you guys know why punk bands have bass players to why carry, badger to carry their amps around <laughs> ah, yeah. it's funny because i am i am the strongest person in the band strongest smelling <laughs> I'm, def- I'm definitely gonna break your fingers so you can't use that soundboard anymore <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, uh, you you like his music? It's it wasn't bad, and I know he still composes uh, a little bit, and I know yeah. he, he likes to write a little bit. Uh, I have I haven't seen him um, put anything out in a while, but uh, I know that he just did a a concert a little while ago where he dressed up in like a a onesie and a, uh, a rabbit mask. I think it was just a beta. Oh, I thought maybe we changed subjects. I, I didn't see that. <laughs> um, I might be making this up, so just uh, <laughs> you know, you fake, fake news, maybe, <laughs> just to keep with are, the political themes. <laughs> are we are sponsored by Russian uh, bots. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're going to uh, move on. I know Badger, you have a few things you wanted to talk about. Yeah, so sadly, there was a uh, musician that passed away, uh, Dick Dale. He helped create surf rock, and his sounds was really what you think of when you hear surf rock. I um, heard earlier on NPR, actually, that Fender had given him, Leo Fender gave him a Telecaster, I believe it was, and he was blowing up all the amps that they tried to give him. And all the amps that were on the market because he was playing it too loud. And I don't know, probably keeping it like on a surfboard or something. I, I'm assuming. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's probably not good. But as long as you have a long extension cord, kids, try that home. Um, <laughs> so Fender made the Showman amp uh, for him. They built it and designed it after going to see one of his shows, Dick Dale's shows. And um, seeing what he, how he played, and why he was blowing up all the amps, and uh, I thought that was kind of cool. So rest in peace and rock on. My uh, next one was about Tom DeLonge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he has a new show coming to the History Channel. Can anyone guess what the subject matter is? Anyone? No. No. no I, I I don't it's- think I'd be able to figure it out. Yeah, so I'm I'm I was surprised as you guys. It's about aliens. So uh, it's called um, something about aliens. Oh, you un- unidentified inside America's UFO investigation, and it's produced by Tom and uh, his To the Stars Academy. 
And I heard it's going to have some uh, people who used to be working for the Department of Defense, and they're going to be talking about the Pentagon's experience with aliens. And how this ties back to music is Tom! They, yeah, they. Um, I heard he's working on a new, uh, what's that? That shitty band he's in? Angels. Yeah, that band. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but it's allowing us to hear some good Matt Skiba tunes. Uh, totally. Skiba to the blink. All right, my last what's happening this week is metalheads drown out the Westboro Baptist bastards. So, according to the Virginia Mercury, which is a local, like, propaganda, I'm sure, but um, (laughs) I don't know. It's a couple hundred metalheads gathered at the capital of the Virginia House to drown out the Westboro Baptist who plans a protest uh, against a transgender lawmaker. So apparently this lawmaker is friends with Randy Blythe, the singer of Lamb of God. And he heard about this protest and it prompted him to get as many people as he can to dress as flamboyantly as they could, you know, people in like devil's costumes and (laughs) people in like rainbow flags and everything to go out and support Danica and peacefully drown out the Westboro bastards. uh, And they ended up having to go home because nobody could hear them yell about how, you know, whatever they yell about, I'm not giving them a platform here. So um, unless they want to come on our show and I can just drown them out, I can just be like, can't hear you, we're in the car. <laughs> okay. And that is the end of what's happening. So we are going to move on to a album review, I believe. Yep. Uh, from our buddy Badger. Uh, it's going to be a review on the album Luke's Prima that just dropped last this past Friday. Yep. A collaboration of Karen O and Danger Mouse. So Badger, take it away. At first light, get it? (laughs) Um, So this album came off exactly as what you would expect from the two collaborators. But as I kept listening, it's just a really good album overall. It's an entertaining and interesting listen. So it's a collaboration, like Fox said, by Danger Mouse and Karen O. And it starts out with this title track that is a dreamy Pink Floyd inspired song. And it's in three parts with like electronic or at least electronically inspired like hip hop drums that really have come to define Danger Danger Mouse from his work with Gnarls Barkley featuring (laughs) CeeLo Green and... Broken Bells featuring James Mercer of The Shins. The first section of the song is straight out of Dark Side of the Moon, except if Nick Mason was cloned by MI6 and <laughs> turned into a robotic replica of like himself with a hip-hop soul. So that's kind of what that sounds like until part like three minutes in and the synths fade and the beat just takes the foreground and you hear Karen's unique voice comes in with this alternative pop style melody that is a reminder of her last work with like the yeah yeah yeahs and some of her solo stuff and it really weaves in with this interesting keyboard melody and the backbeat that keeps it really simple but it has that still sound that the intro gave it and then it ends with the synths coming back in and it just completes this refrain and it just jams out And it really sets the stage for the rest of the album. And the rest of the album just has the same elements of synth and stuff. Some highlights of it for me were the songs Leopard's Tongue, Woman, and Turn the Light, which has been stuck in my head all week long. It's this driving bass that runs a like counterpoint melody over this dance beat and acoustic guitar groove that's providing this accompaniment for the for the song and it's really like upbeat i would recommend listening to that one and woman has been has this more rock feel to it and karen o's distorted sometimes screaming voice like pushes through the heavy drums it reminds 
it's just a heavier song and all the space that was created by the last couple tracks it was all filled in by those heavy symbols and it was really nice contrast to hear then leopard's tongue has this baseline melody that is the main force it reminds me a lot of paul mccartney's bass playing for the beatles and the rest of the song has this psychedelic feeling that reminds me of jefferson airplane and even some of the trippier kinks albums and it's it's a really cool listen the eighth track on the album reveries is this beautiful slow composition of like acoustic but slightly overdriven or distorted guitars kind of like bright eyes early albums had it's an acoustic but you can hear this this uh amount of overdriven or just not quite quite right sound to it and so it's really stripped down and simplistic like Bright Eyes and even some Rilo Kylie uh, acoustic side albums. But with Danger Mouse, he can really provide a lot of production if he wants to. So it, this is a lot of contrast. And it allows Carino's voice to guide the song and just be a prominent force. The album ends with the title track Nox Lumina. Lumina? I don't know. I don't speak Latin. <laughs> but I think it translates no to like night lights and um, it ends the album in this beautiful neoclassical combination of guitars and synths and strings and various percussion instruments like shakers and bells and stuff. It's this big environment that's made. And then the bass comes along and it's starting to tell the story inside this environment and then you hear Karen O start to hint in the melody with this wordless voice, uh, wordless verse that she just hums and sings the notes to what is going to become the melody. And then it melody comes in and it crescendos into this large acoustical environment that you could get up and clap your hands to while dancing in the magical forest on some distant planet somewhere far, far away. <laughs> and then the melody symphony fades into the environment first established in the beginning of the song so we end where we begin just maybe a tad more enlightened jesus right. yeah <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to be moving on to the main event of the podcast uh, this week we will be discussing all things connor oberst we will be ranking our 10 favorite Connor Oberst albums. Uh, this includes Bright Eyes, Better Oblivion. Uh, this includes uh, solo stuff. This includes Monsters of Folk. Uh, Monsters of Folk. Any any band where Connor is a driving creative force for the band is included in this list. And what we're going to do instead of doing a full top ten, we are going to give each person forty five seconds to describe their ten through six. And we are going to be having Jeff, Badger's twin brother, waiting in the wings with a timer for if we go over. He's going to he's just going to dick us if, if we go over. So we're going to try and do 10 through 6 in 45 seconds. I wasn't told I was going to be dicking anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and we are actually going to have Bullwinkle start us off. So get the timer ready, Jeff. And also get that I pen ready it. to sign my check. You got to get that pen ready to sign my check. I got it. I got it. Okay. Cool. So, right. are we ready, Bullwinkle? Ready. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So, the bottom half of my list at number 10, I had When Jamie Went to London. Um, I picked this album because it's the only album where Connor Obers is solely playing drums. Number nine, I had Casadega. Um, the interesting fact on this one is it's listed number 12 on Rolling Stone's top albums of 2007. And number eight, another Bright Eyes album, it was Fevers and Mirrors. Um, I had noted that there's nothing really special about the album as a whole, but it's pretty well written and it fits in well with the Bright Eyes trope. Um, at number seven, I had Outer South. Um, this one's kind of a mixed bag. Some songs are really good, like Roosevelt Room, Snake Hill, um, To All the Lights. And other songs really suck, like Cabbage Town, Big Black Nothing, and Ten Women. Uh, number six is People's Key. It was going to be my number five, but I pushed it down because I wanted to pick another non-Bright Eyes album to put in that spot. Ooh. Got it. All right. It's in just under the time. 
Very nicely done, Bullwinkle. Nicely done. All right, and now we're going to move on to Badgers. Jeff, get the clock ready. You ready, Badger? Ready as I ever am, Jeff. (laughs) Five. Four. four, Three. Three. Two. two, One. one. That's how slow you're going to count, right? It's brotherly advantage, you know? No? Okay, go. Go. All right. So, my top 10 albums are Ruminations by Connor Oberst. Now, this one was originally just supposed to be demos that he was going to send out to the rest of the bands, but then he was like, oh, okay, I'll send it. Okay, and so we got a lot of money. Then he went on White Awake's Morning. This was a double album with another electric album, and it's one of everybody's favorites. It's a cool album. Monsters of Folk, this was a great collaboration with M. Ward, James, Jim James, and a bunch of other people that were already in Bright Eyes. And it's just a really cool album. It has a lot of good songs, and it's featured in The Roots. That's a good band. All right, the Connor Oberst. This is their solo album. It was his first solo album. It has a lot of good songs on it. It didn't make my list because there are so many other better ones, but it was a great album. And Casadega was number six. <laughs> <laughs> oh are you gonna are you gonna are you gonna take up a new career as an auctioneer there uh badger i, like the energy. I might i might <laughs> this is very very energetic i couldn't even uh, jeff you didn't give me the 10 second timer <laughs> you just gave me the finger too i'm gonna tell mom what a douche <laughs> Uh, we're going to move on to my 10 through 6. Hopefully I can uh, get this done in 45 seconds. All right. Are you ready, Mr. Fox? I am. We're going to start in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. At number 10, I put Monsters of Folk, like Badger said. Great collaboration. Lots of good minds coming together. Uh, number 9, Digital Ash, Digital Earn. This is actually the first Bright Eyes album that someone else suggested to me uh it has a sentimental value to me but it just didn't quite make it uh you know higher up on my list uh and then i put lifted or the story is in the soil keep your ear to the ground well that one's gonna take off some of my time uh great album you know bright eyes just killing it and then i went to fevers and mirrors at number seven just to you know bright eyes is awesome and uh you know this one's great didn't didn't get up high enough then i put outer south which is uh Probably one of my favorite albums that Connor's been involved in, just not quite high enough. Was that was that number got six? It. That was number six. I got nice. barely got it. I finished my sentence as the timer went. Nice. Um, okay. Uh, now that that stressful part is out of the way, and we can actually get into the real, uh, the 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 good stuff, where we actually get to take a little bit of time to tell you why. The next five albums are what we consider the best Connor Oberst albums. And we are going to continue in the order we were going. So Bullwinkle is going to start you off with number five. All right. So my number five is Read Music, Speak Spanish by the Desperacitos. Um, I like this album a lot. It's more defined by a punk rock type of genre than Oberst standard emo rock that we're all really familiar with. Um, <laughs> Um, it's definitely got that grungier, like taking back Sunday, early brand new take, but before they were really synonymous with that type of sound, it's a lot of scream singing. Um, the lyrics are socially conscious. Um, the album as a whole is just very good. Uh, favorite song on that I had was greater Omaha. So that's my number five. Good. Number five, uh, Badger, you're number five. Yes. So my number five was lifted. Or the story is in the soil. Keep your ear to the ground. So this one is by Bright Eyes. It's the oldest album I made my top ten. It has every song on it is great. It came out in two thousand two, and so I would consider early Bright Eyes in his studio days of the early days, not the home studio one, but it was very well produced. It includes string sessions. Uh, steel guitar and that's really defines a lot of his newer music 
It had the big hit, Lover I Don't Have to Love, which isn't one of my favorite songs. But like I said, all the songs are great. Um, I was really into this album when I was in my first time of college, when it was an art school. So I wore out a good many burned copies while I was painting and doing drugs. It uh, <laughs> opened up... <laughs> <laughs> it opened me up a lot to a lot of folk music, like more obscure Bob Dylan and a lot more of the folkier side of of history of music. And it's really nostalgic listening back to it. Some of my highlights were false advertising, bowl of oranges and from a balanced beam. Ooh, very nice. Uh, great, great album. I had it. It made my top 10, you know. Uh, I'm going to put I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning at number five. Uh, now, this album has probably my favorite opening song to a, a Connor Oberst album with At the Bottom uh, of Everything. Uh, the story, that it, the little story he tells in the beginning is it makes me laugh and it shouldn't. But uh, this just continues Connor's trend with uh, solid songwriting. I, I honestly don't think there's a bad song on the album. The worst song on the album to, for me is probably Poison Oak. Great song, just just not quite, you know, uh, as good as some of the other songs. Everybody knows the song First Day of My Life off of this album. I know it's been used commercially, which is disgusting. But we all got to make money somehow. Yeah, um, but it has one of my favorite Bright Eyes songs of all time on it, uh, Lua, which oh. is just, um, yeah, rip. Rest in peace, little girl. But Lou is just uh, an amazing song. Um, we are nowhere, and it's now. This song, this album, is just full of some of my favorite Bright Eyes songs. I just, uh, just didn't quite crack the uh, the top for me. Um, when once once you hear the other the, the other four, I got, I think you'll understand why. So that's it for my number five. Now with number five done, we are going to be moving on to Bullwinkle's number four. All right, number four, I had Monsters of Folk. Um, this album was originally billed as the Traveling Wilburys of Our Generation when it came out. It does, however, fall short of that title, but it's overall a very solid album. That's a high uh, the harmon- <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's a high bar to yeah, leap over. Very. Um, the harmonies are actually really good. Obviously, I mean, you have uh, Jim James in there. Mm. Um kind of floats over the melody and often overshadows Connor Ober's lyrics and things like that. The thing that I kept being reminded of through the entire album is how reminiscent of the Beatles it sounds. Uh, There are bits and pieces that it just sounds like that's who you're listening to. Slow Down Joe is definitely very Beatles-esque, especially with those harmonies and um, the lyrics and all that. Uh, I did notice that they use a drum track, so that's a strike against the album. (laughs) Um, I do like that they provide some sage uh, shut up (laughs) some sage advice in uh, never buying anything from a man named Truth which I've never met a man named Truth but going forward I know uh, not to trust that guy you never met Mr. Truth? no have you? yeah he was my science teacher (laughs) he's Uh, he's the one that told me the earth was flat and the dinosaurs gave us AIDS well never buy anything (laughs) from that guy I did I bought snake oil, and then Clearly. when I tried to give it to my snake, he's like, what? I'm just confused. But I – that's funny you said the the thing about the Beatles. I've never picked that up from there, but that song, now that I think of that, it, it does have that kind of sound to it. Yeah, it just sticks – and then it's not like there's anything wrong with that. It's just yeah. – it's how I hear it. And so a lot of good bands do that as well. Right. I mean, there's nothing original anymore anyway. So, And uh, M. Ward played a big part in this album, his writing style. Uh, it, it was picked up as well. And I think that sometimes Connors was out, out of there, but he was definitely the Bob Dylan of the Wilburys uh, in this case. Yeah, and I don't like that comparison. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, I never heard but... that before. Yeah, when I was doing my research, that's what I kept coming across, and I was always like, "Really, traveling yeah. Wilburys? You serious? Yeah, no, <laughs> like it's good, but like, come on." The traveling Wilburys, I would have thought, were would be that um, video that and the collaboration with Jenny Lewis, um, where they did the Wilbury song "Handle with Me with Care," and it was Connor 
and M Ward and uh, Ben Gibbard and a bunch yeah. of other people. Uh, yeah. But yeah, right, well, that's uh, it, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a little strange, but definitely the Beatles thing. Now that you say it, I feel that too. Yep. Um, definitely shines through. Uh, we are going to move on to Badgers number four. Number four for me is Upside Down Mountain by Connor Oberst. This album came out in 2014, and I really listened to it nonstop. Uh, it didn't make anybody else's list because I think they overlooked it. And for a little extent, they don't like good music. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The um, I think it's just so many good Connor Oberst and Bright Eyes albums that this one kind of faded into the back. But this was the one where Dawes was their backing band for mm. where his backing bands when he went on tour and they did a crazy good a tiny desk concert and the people from Dawes were there, the two brothers. And then I think yeah. the bass player was there too, but the, the percussion and everything was really well done in that. And this album too, uh, Connor had said it was all about language. That was the subject matter. And so you could really tell he was exploring that instead of just being emo and sad, even though he's not in the emo scene, he sometimes is emo as a a adjective. But um, this album comes off sounding more like lifted than a lot of his newer solo albums that have a different feel to it. So my favorite songs off this, which I really recommend, are Time Forgot, Enola Gay, Kick, which is a cool rockin' song, and You Are Your Mother's Child, which is a sweet song. And uh, I think he had a video for that one. So I would check that one out on your YouTubes. Yes, on the YouTubes. Uh, and while you're while you're on uh, YouTube looking at that, you should uh, check us definitely out. Ch- check out the other podcasts that we have put up. Our um, podcast, not uh, other people's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my number four uh, is uh, Casadega. It got pushed up a little higher on my list than the other two guys because it, it, this came out the year we graduated high school, Badger and I, uh, 2007. And uh, at that time, I was kind of lost as far as music was concerned. Uh, I, I had you know, left the one band that I was in and... I hadn't. I had yet to join Ordeal by Innocence, so uh, I I thought I would do it, go it alone. And I I thought to myself, who better than Connor Oberst to try and um, emulate? And this album was sitting there, and uh, it's such a good album. Uh, four wins, great, you know, opener. You know, you get songs like Cleanse Song, which uh, now to me definitely is uh, the highlight of the album. Uh, yeah. I must belong somewhere. I'm saying there's just so many good songs on this album, and uh, this it it just uh, a, a little nostalgia pushed it a little bit higher because it, it it means a lot to me as an artist, you know. And uh, Connor, I, I mean, he just did what Connor does. Uh, he pokes fun at religion and the hypocrisy of it all, and it it, it probably has my favorite line for wins definitely does of uh, uh, of any. Connor Oberst lyric, and that's uh, the Bible's blind, the Torah is deaf, and the Quran is mute. Uh, mute. If you burn them all together, you get close to the truth. You know, it, he's just he's such a wordsmith, that, and I don't think there's very many albums where it's as, uh, especially not before 2007, where it's as uh, relevant as this album. So uh, that's why it ended up at my number four. Now we are going to move on to Bullwinkle's number three. All right, so number three, I had lifted. Or the stories in the soil keep your ear to the ground. But going forward, I'll just call it lifted for time's sake. Uh, Rolling Stone actually had this one ranked number four on its top album to 2002, which I thought was interesting. It's always nice to see him recognize some of the lesser known artists. And at 2002, I would definitely say Connor Oberst fits in that profile. Uh, it's definitely one of the best lyrical pieces that Oberst has produced. One of those albums that you really need to listen to from the beginning to the end. Um, there are no real songs on it that kind of stand out. It's more of a a concept that you just have to kind of listen to. When I was trying to figure out how to describe it overall, I found a quote from Drawer B, Drawer B, which I believe is like an online review site, saying that this album is an extraordinary display of over songwriting prowess. It's obscenely ambitious and pretentious and ridiculous, but unquestionably memorable and affecting. And I think that is very appropriate for this album. So that's why it's at my number three spot. Makes sense. Makes sense. 
Uh, Badger, you're number three. Yeah, so my number three album is Noise Floor, which is a collection of songs that were recorded and unreleased between 1998 and 2005. So this came out in 2006, and it's the first Bright Eyes album I ever listened to. And it really broke the prejudice that I had about him being like a whiny crap band because Mm -hmm. that's how some in the punk world looked, world looked at him um, blindly. Uh, If you can look at things blindly, that was what was happening because once I listened to it, I was like, oh, this is really good. It had some really awesome songs that were not emo at all. And I can see why some of these songs never made it onto other albums, but that's the thing with Connor. Some of his best songs are from EPs or single releases, like the Coyote song, uh, which we couldn't put on the. I couldn't put on my list because it was just a music video, and Smoke Without Fire, which is off the Four Winds EP. So a lot of his songs just don't fit into major albums. Uh, so the production on this album goes from heavily and beautifully produced to crackling and barely produced beautiful noise. And some of my favorite songs were Trees Get Whittled Away, Drunk Kid Catholic, Seashell Tale, and the Daniel Johnston cover, uh, Devil Town. Very nice. Very nice. Drunk Kid Catholic is an amazing song. Yeah. Uh, I like that I, song. Yeah, I love that song. Um, we Crawl From The Oceans... Mm. To paint in the caves we're working all weekends we've got to get paid and it's just like chanted I, it's an awesome yeah. song awesome song it's a great album too it didn't make my top 10 but noise floor is um it's a lot of imp- nostalgia too it's the first one i listened to like you like i said yeah the your first out of the punk world um all right, moving on to my number three is the album Connor Oberst. This was uh, not Connor's first release as Connor Oberst, uh, but it was his first big album released as Connor Oberst. I know that he had a bunch of like a bunch of like small uh, cassette tape releases uh, back in the early '90s when I was like four, four or five years old. So this is his first uh, solo CD, and um, I mean. W- such a good album uh you know starting out with cape canaveral just uh you think you're getting like a very specific type of sound for an album and then you you move on into the rest of the album and it it runs the the gambit he's got you know rockin nyc gone gone in there um but he does slow it down again eagle on a pole is, is a great song and i don't think that there's any song that makes me as emotional for some reason as Danny Callahan. It makes me feel such sadness. Yeah. Uh, probably it just makes me think of my mom and uh, what she would do if something were to happen to me or, or either of my siblings. And uh, he just uh, kills it again as he is Connor Oberst, the greatest songwriter of uh, our generation. All uh, time. I know. Of, of, uh, yeah, he's uh... up there. I, we'll we'll eventually get to the list of best songwriters of all time. Mozart, will be, that kid was a punk. That kid was a punk compared <laughs> to Connor, but uh, just in general, and he just, laughs weird. He's like, <laughs> you, so you're, I'm guessing you're taking the uh, movie Amadeus as a complete fact. That was written by Mozart. That was his <laughs> second most favorite op, uh, favorite famous opera. It goes. The magical flute, and then Amadeus. Amadeus, Amadeus. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, Connor Oberst. The album is fantastic. If you've never listened to it and you're listening to this podcast, I don't know what's wrong with you. Maybe um, they don't like Connor Oberst. This is their they, first time hearing the yeah, them. They don't yeah. care for emo music. They don't They're care not for emo, emo. music. <laughs> yes, they are. No, he dude. is. He is an emo balladeer, a country rocker, and a ferocious. Folky rolled into one. Into a joint? Into one fat joint. All right, we are going to move on to Bullwinkle's number two. Number two, I've got I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning. I know we've talked about this a little bit, so I won't touch on it too much. Um, I do like the fact that they feature Amy Lou Harris on various tracks. I think that is a unique choice. Um, it definitely works well with Connor's 
vocals yeah. and they they blend pretty well together for sure uh, yep uh, i like that they weave the personal and political tropes pretty seamlessly i mean you can go through all the lyrics and see you know they've got political persuasions in them and as well as some personal perspectives as well uh favorite songs on the album definitely lua and landlock blues ending ending off the album i really enjoy road to joy as well uh, at the very end, you just have Connor screaming his face off, and then you have all the horns, strings, and percussion just kind of wailing under him. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of took a right turn song. from where you... Yeah, I mean, you kind of expect it to end kind of solemnly, softly, and then he just kind of blows your ears off, which I kind of like. So that's why it's at my number two. It's a good album overall. It's an amazing album. Um, yeah. We're going to be moving on to Badger's number two. And I, before before you start saying anything about the album, Badger, I, this is a, an historic day. The Badger and the Fox have agreed on number two and number one for Connor Oberst albums. Could it happen? It, it happened. I can't believe we actually agree. No, uh, the Fox and I get along <laughs> and agree on most things, but uh, sometimes Especially Connor I got a Oberst being him. emo. Yeah. Dude, Connor Oberst is not an emo band. He's not from the scene. We'll we'll talk about this sometime soon. All right. Yeah, n- yeah, we will talk about this sometime soon. All right. But uh, number two, Badger, for you is Salutations. So oh, yeah. this this is is this this is released as a Connor album, uh, a Connor Oberst album, right? I do believe so. Yeah. 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 So. This mm. is his most recent solo release. Oh, it's in my notes. Um, so <laughs> this is an epic 17-song masterpiece. And one of the reasons it became a masterpiece, I think, is because of the production by Jim Keltner. So we have some drummers in this chat right now. And uh, do you know Jim, who he Jim- is? Jim Keltner was the drummer for the Traveling Wilburys. And he was also the most, uh, Bob Dylan's biographer called him the leading session drummer in America. He played not only for the Wilburys, he played for John Lennon, Ringo, George Harrison, Neil Young, Clapton, Joe Crocker, not to mention all these jazz and other works that he's played on. And he really lent his experience to create this album and give it that feel like it could be made back in that period of time with the folk rock inspired ballads like napalm which just goes real Mm. heavy and it has like a feeling of the vietnam protest days and my favorite songs on the album are uh, mama both mammoth borthwick tacky art tacky i give up tachycardia and a little uncanny those are all really good songs and yeah tack Tacky, tacky, tacka, <laughs> tachycardia. You're close. Tachycardia. I, I think exactly how I said it is how it, <laughs> I looked it up. And uh, since this is my number two as well, I'm just going to continue talking. Cool. Um, yeah, this uh, this album is uh, perfect. Actually, the person who convinced me to listen to this album is Badger. Um, yep. I had taken a little bit of, of a break from listening to Connor when i say a little bit of a break it was a couple months but in those months this album came out and it's uh perfect Uh, i I really don't think that it could be made any better than it was every single song on the album i enjoy uh i don't think there's a bad bad song my my standouts are uh, a little uncanny such a good song Uh, yeah i miss robin williams too me too Uh, yeah, Tachycardia is an amazing song. Mama Borthwick's awesome. Napalm. Uh, Next of Kin is such a sad song. Yeah. So good. Um, one of the ones that I, I, I want to mention is uh, Barbary Coast Later. Yeah. Um, that is uh, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, great ballad. If you get the chance, watch the video that, that was made along with it. Uh, fantastic uh, music video. Uh, Till St. Dipna kicks us out, uh, holds a special place for me as a, um, someone in recovery. He talks about, you know, it's all about out and, and all that. Uh, but you know, we, you get really lucky on, you know, specific songs like Gossamer Thin when yeah. you have 
you get to bring in Jim James to sing backup for you. <laughs> like he, uh, that never he played do. bass for the whole band or for the whole album. I thought, right. Um, I don't think he does for the entire album. I, oh. I think he does for one or two songs. I know. But I have he definitely, it on vinyl. He sings. And yeah. He sings backup there. for like four or five. Yeah. He, yeah. he sings backup for like four or five songs. And I know he plays bass on a couple and, when you can just I, M words uh, appears on on the album, Jillian Welch uh, sings a, a couple backup, uh, you know, sections. Yeah. So everything uh, about the album is amazing. If you can look at the the personnel that appears on the album, it, the, it's the, just like um, a Felice Brothers or the yeah, right or yeah. is it the other ones? No, it's the Felice yeah. Brothers. I saw uh, Ian and James. I saw yeah. um, Bright Eyes with the Felice Brothers one time. It was really good. Um, I can imagine they like were in overalls and didn't have <laughs> shoes on, <laughs> and it was God. a real good time. Um, but yeah, the whole band they got together for this album is really good, and it's weird. The two albums by Connor or Bright Eyes that I have on vinyl are the top two on my list. So it may be I just listen to them in a good uh, medium. But I've also – I originally hear them not on vinyl. So uh, Yeah, you usually do digital first. But but, um, they do sound really nice. The the craziest thing about Salutations being so good is that we heard all these songs already on Ruminations or 10 of them anyways, and he just – he remixes them and makes them into new songs like – who do you know that does that? Connor Oberst. It's the yeah. only person I can think of. All right. We're going to move on to our number one albums. Woo! Can I get a drum roll for Bullwinkle's number one? Um... That is not a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, take it away, Bullwinkle. <laughs> there it is. Connor Oberst. It's my number one album. Mm. Um, I like this album because it's a clear departure from the bright eyes um, that we were all familiar with. It's got more of that folk rock feel to it. And I know the argument can be made. There are a lot of folk rocky style bright eyes songs, but I feel like this one really takes it to the next level. It's got a good blend of that upbeat folk and the melodramatic acoustic folk that you can kind of get those swings between the two. Um, songs like Cape Canaveral and Eagle on a Pole really fit into that melodramatic acoustic um, feel. They're highly introspective. Uh, they can have a number of interpretations. I know Connor means one thing, but I like that you can kind of interpret it your own way. Uh, songs like Moab and Sold Out take nice. a more in-your-face, yeah, on-the-nose approach. Um, they definitely have a clear thing that you can't really mistake, and it permeates all of those songs. Um, the other thing I really like about this are there are really no bad songs on the album. Mm-hmm. Um, there is that random conch horn blowing that I think is kind of weird uh, to be I thrown like in it. there. I, a, I skip I skip didn'geridoo. that every time. But is that a didgeridoo? <laughs> is it a didgeridoo? I don't know. It no. reminds me of like a. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. <laughs> can we can we have that on the podcast? <laughs> I, I think it'll be okay. All right, <laughs> but that that's what it reminds me of like that ceremonial like horn thing. I don't know what it is. Wait, it's a, that, it's, is that this for sure <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah i mean from cape canaveral at the beginning through milk thistle the entire album's really good it really showcases over is taking his song right into the next level it's a clear departure from bright eyes and that's why i really like this album as my number one it's definitely uh it's for me. It's like a transformative album for Connor. Like he, yep. you can tell he he went from being bright eyes to you know stepping out from behind that shadow while still putting out bright eyes music. But right. everything changes for with this album. Yeah, he gets away from that formulaic approach that he always kind of took with bright eyes, which yep. is refreshing. Very very refreshing. And now, the number one for both Badger and myself is. The People's Key! Key, 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 key. <laughs> Badger, why do you like The People's Key so much? 
All right. This album is Trippin' Balls and from another <laughs> planet sent to Earth on a spaceship by Elon Musk and refined by the atmosphere as it was approaching the planet. Bright Eyes is known to have that intro track. All right. Yeah. <laughs> the intro track. Um, that intro was, track, was, you know what I'm talking about. That could be considered noise. Um, like on all the albums, right? It's like that first track that maybe it's an overheard phone conversation and like a noisy car ride or static white noise, or in this case, some crazy dude, um, lizard people, right? So yeah, talk about lizard don't, people. Don't don't let this rambling guy throw you off because. It, you would be missing out on some awesome songs. Uh, Bullwinkle started uh, saying while we were discussing this week, like a couple of weeks ago, um, that he thought this album was one long song. And uh, it may be in some kind of like beautiful audio movie or something, but from Shell Games to J. June Stars to One For You, One For Me, this album is just the best so far so this is a bar connor you gotta get above it uh the shell games was a great song and uh holly celesi ja rastafari ja bless ja bless yeah and ladder song um they those were the standouts for me what Um, about you uh, i can't say a bad word about this album fuck it's um firewall is one of my favorite songs of all Sorry, time grandma. <laughs> because of and it's because of the rambling speech of i can't remember the guy's name um he but talking about lizard people and then going into the actual song of firewall um you know every time i listen to it i literally bust through the firewall into heaven because the rest of the album is just so good uh jay june stars kicks so much ass it is yep. such a rocking song uh, and then you get you approximate sunlight where he slows it back down and then picks it right back up with Holly Celesi. Your job bless. And um, there's Rasta not a bad. Rai. Yeah, there's not a bad song on this album. It's Connor at his finest songwriting and uh, just musical creativity as far as the, the sounds he's putting out. It's um, it's just a classic for me. The very first time I listened to the album, I knew that it would be one of the, the the my one of my favorite albums of all time it's definitely in like my top five albums of all time it's uh, in my with, top five connor doubt. oberst albums too well i mean yeah mine too that's what oh, we're wait, doing here is that what we're talking about oh, <laughs> yeah. sorry i was no, facebooking it's in, right now it, um, no, get somebody off put you. somebody took a picture of their dog and it was cute uh, uh well that's fine uh, but not as cute as my Connors. dog yeah, uh, Adobe is uh, adorable. Yeah, in a very ugly way. Uh, hey, but this, this people, people say he looks like me. Uh, they do say dogs start, or rather, owners start to look like their dogs. Maybe. Yeah, but uh, that's why yeah, I got all these muscles. <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything about this album is perfect. Uh, a machine spiritual is a great song. Uh, like I could just tell you, every single song is great. I know that uh, he didn't. He wasn't the sole writer on Approximate Sunlight. Someone else wrote that with him. But uh, I think it was um, Nate uh, Nate Walcott. Yeah, uh, he's and, uh, the uh, trumpet player and uh, keyboard player, and plays a bunch of other instruments for most of Con- uh, Connor's work. And he's also the uh, producer for a lot of it, recording engineer and stuff. He's right. a vital part. One of the only true members of Bright Eyes. Uh, once he settled, there's the yeah. um, the straight yeah, steals he, guy. Yeah, he's he's just uh, Steel Connor Steel. brought him along for sure, um, for sure. But sure. yeah, this uh, this album is uh, sure. will hold a special place in my heart forever. I will be th- this is one of the yeah. albums I'll be showing my kids and my grandkids and hopefully they they grab onto it like i did my parents music i mean it it's a good album but don't you guys ever find yourself just asking like what the hell's going on like i mean in general or like i was <laughs> <to my album? laughs> about to say that's my Both. entire life already <laughs> no just with the album it just seems so discombobulated and i mean i know structure has never been a thing for bright eyes but it just i don't know it, it doesn't it just seems flow for way, you. it doesn't flow it's way out there 
And that's why I kind of said it sounds like one long song because I don't know where one song stops and oh, the next I, one starts. Yeah, I do. I, uh, <laughs> it I think it just goes with my schizophrenic mind. When the, uh, Maybe. when the needle hits the vinyl, that's yeah, when then... <laughs> it starts. And then when after you put the needle off the vinyl, flip the vinyl, put it back on the vinyl, and then it spins, 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 then it's done. And then the needle gets off the vinyl. Uh, yeah, I, I actually uh, I agree. Okay. This for me, like I don't think I've ever listened to this album like just a song. I think I've put the album on and listened to the whole album right. every time because yeah. uh, I don't use vinyl, so it's really convenient for me to just like. So you click put a the needle on the MP3 and yes, and okay. it spins and it spins, spins, spins metaphorically, spins. and it, it stays in my head right, for days. Round, like an MP3. Um, right, in fact, round, I'm round, I'm due round. for a, a sit down and listen to, which I might do right after the podcast, just to turn off all Should the lights I in my put room. Put it on right now. So we, uh, everybody just listens for an hour and a half to the guy an, talking about lizard people. I'm pretty uh, sure we get sued, or we'd have we to would. pay some money or something. Yeah, we know. would. We don't have the money uh, for that yet, because yeah. uh, I need to get my checks from Jeff. So we can't afford that right now. He's um, you didn't send the check. He's pa- he's pa- he's paying me. Yeah. No, he says that since um you missed the last meeting, uh you were ten minutes late. We're docking your pay. Uh, what that's bullshit yeah so now all your pay goes to the badger thanks no 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 (laughs) i thought you guys didn't get along no i i didn't i didn't think so either i mean (laughs) but you know when like the oasis guys were um not fighting that one year (laughs) yeah when they tried it again yeah and then, so any second, I might throw a chair through that guy's <laughs> fucking studio glass window right there. It, what kind of guy has stained glass windows between the recording booth and the podcast table? It's like, Jeff. and it's a picture of his face. And I don't know. It's. I think he's implying he's Jesus or something. Well, that's what I was thinking. That, that's my name. And I was like. All right, and as you guys know, after we're done doing our top 10, or in this case, our top five albums, we create a weighted list and then cover a song off of the winning album. So here is our weighted list. We are going, I'm only going to do five. So at number five, we had Monsters of Folk with 19 points. It ended up on everyone's list, I'm pretty sure. So it makes sense. At number four, we have Casadega with 20 points barely squeaking out over monsters of folk there at number three we had i'm wide awake it's morning with 27 points uh, and also connor oberst solo album with 27 points and our number one album with a weighted list is the people's key with 34 points so a pretty pretty large margin that just proves that badger and i are right about everything yep Yep, well, especially the badger. Especially the fox. Nope. But uh, nope. And, and as you know, we, we pick a song off of the you know number one album to uh, cover as a band. And we will be covering Holly Celesi. So look for that on our SoundCloud, uh, which we will link on Facebook and all the other bullshit social media things. Give us um, your data. But no, seriously, yeah, exactly. like us and uh, yeah, like follow us. us We're tell awesome. your friends and uh, donate um, just by sending cash in the mail to Badger. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the post office will know where it goes. 12 Bar News Podcast was recorded at 12 Years Dungeon Studios in Trenton, New Jersey. The sound engineer, Jeff Damon, webmaster, Daniel Marshall, Resident Iowan, Mike Stanley, and your host slash delinquent, Patrick Stofflet. Thanks for tuning in. 12 years dungeon! <laughs> <laughs>